Uh, hello there. We're here at the Open University today in Milton Keynes. I'm Alan Thomas and this is Alison Robson and we're joined by a wonderful live audience. Alison is a PhD student here at the Open University itself and you are studying the BDSM as religious practice, which is a completely new area to me. So I'll start off with a very beginner's question for the naive amongst us. What is BDSM? Okay, well, BDSM is an acronym that's usually described as standing for bondage, domination, submission and masochism. Um, there are other options for pretty much all the letters except the B. Um, it basically covers a whole range of practices that you might describe as kinky, so tying each other up, causing pain, playing with sensation, emotion, those kind of things. Okay, and what what is the aim of your research? What are you hoping to find? The aim of my research is uh, initially to look at BDSM experience and consider whether it can be understood from a religious studies perspective, whether that adds anything to the study of BDSM uh, or indeed the study of religious studies. Um, but also underneath that, I'm exploring the point at which um, the category of religion blurs with the category of non-religion and where things cross over from one category into another. Um, I think that's an interesting question. Mm. Well, based on what you were just saying, how do you connect BDSM to religious studies okay. or, or religion per se? Okay. It has to come down to how you understand the term religion, I think. Um, so for me, you have to get rid of the A in front of religion. I'm not talking about a religion. I'm not saying BDSM is a religion. I'm saying it is religion uh, in a far more broader sense. So from, from my perspective, religion is about things that people do. And it's an active process of creating your world, creating meaning in your world, making stories about your world, understanding your place in the world, building relationships between the world, yourself, other of all kinds. Um, and anything that contributes to that can reasonably be considered to be part of religion. I should also mention I don't make the absolute distinction some people make between religion and spirituality. Um, while I accept a lot of the people I've talked to in my research regard them as two different things and prefer one term over the other, uh, if you actually ask people for their definitions of both, the difference is, is minuscule. Um, they're far too closely connected to say that they're totally separate things, so I use them pretty much interchangeably. Um, well, you were speaking about people that you've, uh, that you've interviewed. How do you find people to interview on this topic in the first place? Okay, well, uh, the kink community, if you read uh, the literature, and there isn't a great deal, but if you read the literature that exists around studies of, of kink communities, it divides into two categories very clearly. Some people say it's a really hard, closed community to research, um, and they had great difficulty finding people, and other people say, I found it really easy, everyone wanted to talk to me. The difference, as far as I can tell, is whether or not you are a member of the community or known to members of the community to begin with. Um, I think if you start from the position of not going, oh, look at these crazy people, look at the crazy things that they do, um, then you've got a sort of a, a starting level of trust there. And there is an awful lot of exotic, exo exoticization, is that a word? Um, there's a lot of othering about kink and kink practices. There are a lot of stereotypes around it. And I think if you're starting from a position where it's clear that you know those are stereotypes that don't apply to most people and that it's really not exotic and bizarre and psychotic and all of those things um, then you start from a position where people expect you to take them seriously as opposed to they're expecting you mm. to laugh at them. Are they generally quite forthcoming? Yeah, yeah I've had some really good interviews um, with some really interesting people. Oh super um, just a general question for all the academics how do you get ethical clearance for that is it a difficult process? Um, very well I wouldn't say it was a difficult process. It was a, a rather more drawn out process than it might have been. Um, I spent a lot of time thinking about some of those stereotypes, actually, and thinking about some of the objections that might be made. Um, and then I tried to address all of them in my ethical application. So, for example, um, I pointed out that I'm aware of the legal ambiguities surrounding many of the practices of BDSM. And I've addressed that by saying, A, I'm not asking anyone to do anything particular. Um, and B, I'm talking to people in neutral spaces, so I'm not interviewing people within play spaces or within play clubs or anything like that and talking to them in neutral spaces about things they would be doing anyway um, which puts me as f as far as you can tell how the law stands at the moment that puts me on the right side of the law with regard to the practice so it was just thinking about lots of little things like that um, and trying to address them in my application and the only query they came back to me with was could I be clearer that I was only going to talk to over 18s oh okay um I, I was wondering, um, would 
when you look at BDSM as a, a form of religious expression or as a religious experience, does it tie in with more traditional types of religion or is it or is it something that you would uh, consider that you've had to approach from a slightly different theoretical angle? It's an interesting question, actually, um, because to my mind, I've approached it from a, a different theoretical angle. I haven't made the comparison with aesthetics or with the medieval flagellants or any of those things um, that might seem more obvious. I haven't drawn those comparisons, but an awful lot of my research participants did draw those comparisons when we started to talk about religion and how they understood religion and whether it related in any way to what they did. Um, and they started talking, flagellants was a very common one, but also Hindu mystics who do various um, physical things like sticking needles through various extremities and things like that. So those connections are there, um, but the way I wanted to come at it was less about going, this is religious, does BDSM look like that? And more about asking people what role BDSM had in their lives, how it wove into the rest of their lives, and then seeing whether that could be understood to be the way religion weaves into people's lives. Could you provide a particular example of a f f uh, of a, an example of BDSM that would be considered as a religious experience? I, I could give you lots of examples from my research, but I couldn't give you categorically this will always be a religious experience for everyone because it's very personal. Mm. Um, something that happens during some BDSM play, intense BDSM play, is something called spacing. Um, and it can be uh, subspace or top space. It can happen to both, but it's qualitatively different. So subspace has been touched on in research as being comparable to mystical experience. When you achieve subspace, um, all of your senses change. Um, you become a lot less vocal. Some people lose the ability to speak entirely. Your sense of what's being done to your body is completely different. Um, one of my research participants uh, told me in great detail how concerned she was for her top because from her perspective he was standing on the ceiling uh, because her whole vision had just got skewed. So she felt like she was perfectly upright and he was standing on the ceiling and then she was really worried he was going to fall off. And she spent about half an hour trying to get him to come down and stand on the floor with her. So everything becomes um, changed in ways that are quite difficult to describe. Mm. Um, and it takes time to come back from that and to come back into your body and to sort of recollect yourself again. Um, and now that would be considered by a lot of people to be a transcendent experience, a mystical experience, a spiritual experience. So that would be the most obvious example. Um, but you can also, you get people talking about um, breaching limits or breaching boundaries that they didn't know they could cross, finding things out about themselves and what they could do uh, or, in, or take that they didn't know before. So one of the people that I spoke to, who's a switch, so he plays both top and bottom roles, um, but he talked about having a beast in the bottle and he said one of the nice things about BDSM is I get to let my beast out of the bottle and he can do whatever he likes and, and nobody's upset about that, no one's judging that and then I can put him back in the bottle again and everything's fine. Um, so he was talking about self-discovery and pushing limits in a, a safe environment with people who want to push limits with him. Yeah. So sort of mutual exploration. So I think any of these sorts of things can be considered religious. Um, if you wanted more overt religious imagery, some people play with crucifixion scenarios, for example, um, or you get people playing with uh, religious lifestyles, as in nuns and monks and, and that sort of penance. Mm. Um, some people play uh, with race roles as well, so they play with slavery and slavers and those, those kind of roles to explore them. Um, There's a huge variety, really huge. I, for, for what you were just saying about the uh, the variety, what else could we consider as religious practice? Until until I'd met you, I'd never considered BDSM as religious practice um, before. What other doors does it open for religious studies? What from, else? From my perspective, in my opinion, anything at all. Uh, it comes down to the person doing it and how they feel about it and what they're using it for in their life. So it's very idiosyncratic. Um, but if you take the time to talk to people and to unpick the experiences and what they're doing, then I think almost anything, really. And are there any other scholars at the moment who are currently looking at BDSM and religious practice? Not specifically, to my knowledge, uh, as religious practice. There is, uh, as I said, there's a little bit of work looking at its comparison with mystical experience. Mm. Um, and there's a little bit of work by the same author actually setting out um, qualities of religions, if you like, as in institutional religions. These are the things that religions have, and we've got some comparisons to those things in BDSM. Um, but I'm not aware of anyone 
coming at it from the other side, as it were. I'm not aware of anyone looking specifically at the experiences. Um, a couple of people have looked at the nature of play, which is what you call doing BDSM, have looked at the nature of that from different perspectives. So there's a, a scholar in the state, Stacey Mumar, who's looked at play uh, from an anthropological perspective as an aspect of community and community building. Um, the actual experience of play is very under-researched, and she says, she says so herself. It's very few people looking specifically at that. Yes, you were mentioning how uh, it's it's considered uh, you could consider it as religious practice. When you interview people, do you find that um, they are quite open to the idea of it being considered religious, or do they prefer the spiritual but not religious aspect, or are they completely cut off from that whatsoever? I know we can apply our own definitions of religion to what they say, but I'm, I'm just wondering from their perspective. It's an interesting question, actually, and it's far more complex to answer than you might think it would be. Um, I started by talking to people genu generally about their experiences and what their experiences were doing. So the conversation about religion came at the end of the interview. And I suspect, although I didn't test it, I suspect I would have had very different if I'd done it the other way around. Um, a lot of my participants very hostile to the word religion. Mm. Um, and a large number of those who were very hostile to the word religion preferred the term spirituality. Uh, and the difference that they identified there was authority. That was really the only concrete difference that you could say they were picking up on because they were talking about it as dealing with the same sorts of things. But religion tells you how you should do that and spirituality doesn't uh, in their understanding. Um, but I also spoke with a number of people who were practicing uh, forms of paganism, mostly it was paganism, who considered their BDSM to be a religious practice and used the term religious. I also spoke to people who objected to both terms, religion and spirituality. Um, but what came out, and what I would say all of my research participants agreed with, is that when you unpick their kink and what it is their kink does for them and how they use it in their lives, you can pull out all sorts of strands. You can say it's teaching me about myself. You can say it's giving me out-of-body experiences. You can pick out all these different strands but there's still something else left, something else in inverted commas left. Mm. Um, and to me, that something else is what signals that it stopped being just a leisure practice or just sexual foreplay or just any of these other things. And it's become religious because it does more for them than mm. any of those single factor explanations. And when we talked about that in various ways, um, the word I used in my interview schedule was meaningfulness, which is a horrible word. Um, but the word that emerged from one of my interviews for it was gestalt, which is the word I want to use for it in my thesis. Um, and I think all my research participants would be in agreement that there is something else. There is this nebulous other ingredient to their kink that makes it more than just X, Y or Z. And they were all accepting of the fact that I was choosing to apply the term religion to that, even though they didn't all agree that the term religion as they understood it fitted. They agreed that as I understood it, it fitted. Do you think that the influence of your interview could make them approach BDSM in a slightly different way or the way they think about BDSM? If they'd, if they'd started an interview with you and were very hostile to the concept of religion and then by the end of your interview were a little bit more open to the idea of it having religious themes, do you think that would, that would potentially make them look at what they do in a different way? I certainly think it, would, it made some of them think more about what they were doing. Um, simply because they hadn't put it in the terms that I was putting it in and they hadn't asked themselves some of the questions that I was asking uh, because I was trying to get at things that aren't intrinsically linguistic so we did a lot of sort of unpacking and working through things saying well it's not this and it's not this but there's a bit of this um, so there were some quite complicated exchanges going on and so I certainly think it made people think whether it would make anyone go and say you know what I practice religious BDSM I don't know, but maybe in 20 years' time, when I've persuaded other people that religion isn't what they all think it is, maybe then. You'll have started a new religion. <laughs> well, maybe, yeah. <laughs> I do hope not. <laughs> do, you, uh, do you find that, we were speaking about people who were quite hostile to the concept of religion, do you, did you find that many people not, not only may have been religious, but had already considered what they do to have a religious angle, or yeah. was it new to all of them? No, absolutely. There were, there's a... I wouldn't say a large section within the kink scene, but there is a recognised uh, concept of sacred kink. There are books about it that have come from within the scene. Uh, it's usually attached to paganism, but not always. So I spoke to uh, Sue Sharman, for example, who considered his 
kink to be a part of his religion, although not always. And he was very interesting uh, on the points at which it changes over and the differences between a play space and a ritual space for him. Um, I spoke to a Wiccan who also considered their play to be an aspect of their religion, a practice of their religion, and an offering of themselves to the deities that they work with. Um, so yeah, I spoke to a few people, but I wasn't, if I'd been specifically looking for people who considered their kink to be religious practice, I could have found plenty. So mm. these are just the ones that cropped up in my sample by accident almost. I wasn't looking for those people. Well, as, as for you and your research, you mentioned to me earlier that you were approaching the end of your PhD, mm -hmm. furiously writing the thesis up. What, what do you hope that this research would lead to for yourself? What, what's, the, what's the next step? For me, I'd like to finish the thesis. Well, yes, of course. Um, but other than that, I, I'm not 100% sure. I think there are all sorts of other strands that have come out of the research that I've done that would be fascinating to research and to look into further, um, some of which are more closely tied to religious studies than others, perhaps, but I'm quite interested um, in the connections and separations between BDSM and self-harm, for example. I did my master's on self-harm um, and it, it cropped up in a number of conversations about where the differences comes in. And I think that sort of thing ties into this idea of something else. Mm. Um, and when that's there, can you still call a behaviour self-harming? I don't really know, but I'd quite like to find out. Um, so there are a lot of other strands that I think would be really interesting to research, whether anyone will be willing for me to do that under the title of their institution. I don't know. We'll have to see. I'm sure there will be. Um... Uh, speaking as an uh, NRM specialist, I'm just generally curious, do you find that um, people who practice BDSM tend to practice more, uh, tend to belong to more minority religious movements or are they, or do they tend to be more traditional to use the term? I would say they tend to be, I, I, I suppose I'd have to say they tend to belong more to minority religious movements, but they're far less interested in labels. Mm. And I haven't done a quantitative sample of their attitudes to labels against the general population, so I can't say, you know, as a scientist. But I would say, generally speaking, they have a more complex view of labels than the general population. So, for example, I, I said earlier, BDSM is an acronym, and, and it is. That's how it ended up in the lexicon of the English language. But each of those words means some very complex things. And it would be entirely possible to consider yourself to be within the BDSM scene and not do any of the things that are covered by those words. And most people on the scene are very conscious of that. And I had some very interesting conversations with people about labels like masochist and whether it applied to them. And if it did apply to them, what would it have to mean in order for them to accept it as a meaningful label for them? So there's a lot of reflection about labels. And I think that spills over into labels about religion as well. So I asked everyone if they consider themselves to be religious, if they considered themselves to be spiritual, um, if they considered their kink to be religious or spiritual. I asked them all of those things and I got generally far more reflective answers than I would have expected before I began the research. Um, so I've got one person saying, well, I'm a Buddhist. That's if I'm anything. But then again, I might be a Hindu. But that's if I'm anything. And, and he sort of riffs on this for a good couple of minutes, going, what am I? Can I attach a label to this? I have another person who's very definitely Hindu and very clear that he's a Hindu, um, but who gave me a good five-minute lecture on what he considered to be the difference between religion and spirituality and how Hinduism had to be both in order to be meaningful and kink had to be part of that as well because otherwise there was no point to any of it because it's all a diamond that you have all these facets attaching to. And I think if I'd just pulled an average Hindu out of the general population, would I have got that kind of reflection from them? I think probably not. I think there's something about fitting into this kind of very complex, fluid community that encourages you to think about labels in a way that when you're then confronted with other labels, it affects that way of thinking. Fab. Um, you know, I'm going to f finish with this. I'm okay. just... Uh, very curious. We've been discussing how to approach BDSM from a religious studies perspective. Once your thesis is complete and it's out there for the world to see, what what effect could this have on religious studies methodology? What else could this research connect to? How could uh, potential undergraduates or postgraduates use this work? I would like to think that it could encourage the study of religion to move further away from institutions and things with labels on and to look more at the complexities of religion 
as people do it. So lived religion is the main theoretical framework I'm working with and that takes you some way in that direction. But people are still hung up on putting this A in front of it. It's A religion, it's not A religion. This is A leisure activity, it's not A religion. And I think this idea that there is some other ingredient that you can't, you have to look at the whole thing and talk to the people who are doing it and you find this other ingredient coming through, I think that offers potentially an analytic tool for looking at all sorts of different human activities and thinking, well, do these contribute to this religioning process in this person's life, even if they don't in that person's life? I would like to think that could be a very useful tool. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Alison, and thank you, our lovely audience. Thank you. Thank you. That's an official way of signing off. <laughs>